Okay. Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna talk about something. Probably you heard a related talk, uh, maybe the, the last talk uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, we will offer a little bit different uh, aspect about uh, what it, it's called a consensus-based non-convex optimization. Uh, all right. So uh, now, of course, the machine learning uh, or uh, deep neural network is a very hot field uh, in science and. Typically, in those uh, in machine learning problems, at the end of the day, you have to solve a minimization problem. All right, so essentially, you have to find uh, the way it works in machine learning is that you you have this uh, training data, which is x i hat, and your targeted data is y i hat, and you're trying to find a function sort of approximation f. Uh, such that uh, after it goes through, through the network F, you are very close to your target data in some, uh, uh, here L is some kind of loss function, all right? And here you have a summation of all the data. So this X, uh, this X here uh, can be very high dimension. And also this L, capital L, the loss function may be non convex. So you're talking about uh, very high dimensional long convex optimization. And we all know such optimization process is MP hard. So here are a few just examples of uh, machine, deep neural network, which has been very successful in image processing and natural language uh, processing. And most recently, like uh, this use AI technology to find uh, the structural proteins. So there has been a lot of uh, exciting development in the area of um, deep neural networks and uh, artificial intelligence. All right, so typically uh, the most standard, uh, most popular method to solve a very high dimensional uh, optimization problem in machine learning is this uh, gradient descent method. Okay. So uh, more, uh, so here uh, we are familiar with uh, this gradient descent method where you basically, uh, so the f is your target function. So you essentially you take a tail expansion around x k. All right, you, you stop uh, after you after gradient term. So if you want to take the steep descent, and you want to take the increment in x to be in the negative the gradient of f direction. Okay. And so this gradient descent method is. Uh, what you, you typically do is, okay, so this gradient descent method, xk plus y is xk minus gradient f. All right, so you do iteration on this. However, if you have a very high dimensional problem, so you have to take gradient of very high dimensional problem and this f is a summation of many, many loss functions. So it's very expensive. Another problem is that uh, very often this gradient descent method, because you move along the uh, steep descent direction, so if you happen to hit a local minimum, that is, you get stuck there. And, but your goal is to find the global minimum. All right, so that's the major difficult if you take green descent uh, method. The, the stochastic green descent, the idea is that here in the gradient, instead of taking the gradient of all direction, you take a few, you randomly select a few directions. You only take the gradient around those few directions. And also in this F, Remember this F can be a summation of many, many loss functions. So instead of add all the loss functions, you randomly pick a few, a few I, okay? You randomly pick a few I, you take so-called a mini, random mini batch. And there are two advantages here by doing the stochastic gradient descent. First, of course, if you only take a minimum, um, a, a few a small batches, you save the computational cost a lot. But more importantly, because you selected these uh, batches randomly, so you effectively we add noises. So you may get trapped in a local minimum. Once you have some noise, you have some probability to jump out of the local minimum and you have more better probability to eventually converge to the global minimum, all right? So that's the, there are various uh, variation of this green descent, but the green, de, uh, stochastic green descent is, uh, is the essential uh, mechanism, which uh, drives the success of uh, 
this deeper neural network, all right? However, when you take use the gradient descent method, well, by definition, you have to take gradient here, all right? But of course, there are functions, and there are also cases where you, you cannot take gradient. I mean, F does not have the gradient. So in a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms, they always encounter the difficult of so-called uh, gradient vanish or gradient uh, exploding, all right? So many bad things can happen during uh, the training process of your neural net network. So therefore, an alternative method, which is gradient free, seems to be attractive for a lot of applications, okay? So that's the kind of method we're gonna talk about. You do not want to take gradient. You only have to evaluate the function. Of course, the gradient free optimization problem is not, it's not new, okay? There's, there's a big industry called the meta heuristics. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, such a method. Uh, here I give a few, a couple of uh, famous ones, for example, simulated annealings. All right. Again, this method are kind of a stochastic method, which uh, allow the probability to jump out of the uh, local minimum. Uh, another a very uh, popular method is called generic al algorithms. So these are some of the examples where you only have to evaluate functions. You never have to take the gradient. And the class of method I'm going to introduce uh, belongs to the class of method that's usually called a uh, swarming intelligence. So the idea of swarming intelligence is actually consider a lot of uh, particles, all right? You have uh, agents, they kind of interact with each other. So although individual particles can move in some random fashion, but collectively they exhibit some intelligence, which uh, it's not the case individually, but all together. Okay, they sort of uh, behave, they have some intelligent behavior, like, like what is shown here in this cartoon, all right? So here are this uh, contour of this uh, loss function. So initially you just say, you put these particles uh, uniformly everywhere. Then you see that they, they communicate with each other in such a way that eventually they will converge to this global minimum. Okay, so that's the general idea. So the swarm intelligence, there are a lot of swarm intelligence, which was learned actually from nature. So there are a lot of different swarm intelligence uh, algorithms, for example, flockings and this uh, B, what is called artificial B colonization optimization, and colony optimization. These are all, all sort of uh, learned from nature, how these uh, animals and uh, insects uh, build their society. And all okay, right, so these, these are all motivated by nature. However, I mean, uh, well, this, I, I quote this sentence from Wikipedia. It's not my, my comments, all right? So the meta heuristic algorithm has been very popular, but uh, I mean, the, most of the research have, uh, uh, it's not very rigorous. So this, I quote this uh, sentence uh, from this review article, which says that actually most literature on meta heuristics is, is experimental in nature describing empirical results, and it's mostly computer experiments, all right? It said, while the field also features high quality research, many of the publications have been of poor quality. Flaws include the vagueness, lack of conceptual elaboration, poor experiments, and well, ignorance of previous lecture, literature. And here, uh, what well, we are in interested is to develop a, a swarming intelligence particle system where one can prove some kind of convergence toward, clo uh, toward global minimum, all right? And also the method works for general non-convex high dimensional functions. So we want to do things a little bit more uh, rigorous. Well, our starting point actually are these two papers. Uh, these are the school in Kaiser Slaughter and later Jose Carrillo, who is now in Oxford, a joint effort. So the idea actually is to use the following particle system, which is actually very simple. So here we can see the M particles, okay? So this is the dynamics of J's particle, which is the first term is actually is the drift term. So minus lambda is kind of like a relaxation uh, time. So here act J minus some, some kind of average, which we def define next, all right? So of course this term actually is the exaggerated relaxation time, relaxation term of some time, xj will be driven to this average, okay? 
And then add some Brownian motion term, which the Brown motion actually depends on the stress of Brownian motion, depends on this deviation of XJ from this uh, average. All right, sigma just some constant. And here's the key is how to define this average. And the average is the following. So it's actually it's a weighted average of the particle positions where the weight is e to the minus beta times this loss function evaluated at xj. And then you normalize it, all right? So here we, the weight is designed such that, remember if the value of, here assume L is positive, all right? Without loss of generality. So if the value of L is small, the weight is bigger. So essentially assign more weight, higher weight, bigger weight to the particles with small L value of L. Okay, and then, well, if beta is sufficiently large, if this beta, so here actually the weight is like, looks like Gibbs measure, okay, Gibbs distribution, where beta is like one over temperature, where L is like the energy, okay. So, of course, when the beta is small, then of course, uh, you, the, the tendency is towards the lower value of L. So actually one can prove, like actually they proved, if beta is sufficiently large, then particles form a consensus, which means particles all, they converge toward each other. That's what consensus means. And consensus is actually the global minimum of L. And the convergence speed is exponentially fast, okay? However, they have some uh, con uh, conditions for these parameters, lambda and sigma, and here is the condition, which means that uh, this drift rate lambda should be bigger than uh, one half of sigma square times d, where d is the dimension of x. Okay. So under this condition, one can prove, uh, well, there's some condition on the initial data, all right? And then you can show that the method actually converge and converge very fast, exponentially fast, to the global minimum. Okay. However, here, uh, the, the issue here is that but D can be large, as I mentioned in machine learning problem, D can be easily thousands, tens of thousands, even millions. So then the chip rate is, is very big, which, which then it may happen that uh, uh, when you are very close to global minimum, all of a sudden you are driven away, you are driven away from the low global minimum. Okay. Well, the reason, uh, let me say that one more was about the choice of this weight, which is very essential. The reason this, this weight works it's because it's uh, following a Laplace principle, which is a very powerful uh, result in large deviation theory. And it's very popularly used in, in the field of mathematical finance. So the Laplace principle says that for any probability measure rho, which is company supported, and this X star, the global minimum, is in the support of rho. Then the limit when beta goes to infinity of this, the integral of e to the minus beta L with d rho, and you take log and divide by beta. And that limit actually is nothing but the global minimum of L. Of course, you have to assume that X star global minimum is the support of uh, rho, okay? So this basically means that um, if L has its global minimum in the support of uh, rho, then when beta is sufficiently large, okay, essentially if you normalize this e to the minus beta L uh, well, times this uh, P, uh, property measure, then and this, uh, it will assign most of the mass to a small neighborhood around X star, okay. And that's what you want. So eventually, eventually you want everybody to converge to the small neighborhood of the L star and how close it is depends on the choice of beta. All right. Well, of course, this method works, which is quite effective if D is not very large, okay? However, if D is very large, which is the case in machine learning problem, then this method is not very, very, very effective. So therefore, and we try to have a method which is sort of uh, less sensitive to dimension, okay? So later they joined with Jose and Lei Li, who is a young research in my institute, Yu Hua Zhu was uh, my former PhD student from, uh, from Wisconsin, but she's now a poster at Stanford. 
So our idea actually is to make small change from their model, very, very small change. So the way, essentially what we change is we erase this, uh, this bar here. So here, uh, as you can see here, and we take a sort of uh, isotropic, all right, so this normalized uh, strength of the brown motion. Our idea actually, instead of using the same for all the component of XJ, here for all the component of XJ, use same strength. All right, our idea is to actually use component-wise brown motion. So we just delete essentially this bar. So then we have this point-wise, component-wise brown motion. Okay. And we have some other tricks here for the summation. When usually the summation, this particle here, summation, there are a lot of terms. We use this mini batch, random mini batch idea. All right. But that's not the most essential part. So I will mainly concentrate why, why this, this is better, this component wise noise. To see that, let's use a simple example to illustrate, give you some uh, intuition why this is better. So let's consider the case when, the, uh, when this average is constant. All right. And when this constant, then essentially, when this is constant, this guy's constant, essentially you can solve this uh, equation analytically. And in the previous model, this GL, I will call a German model, then you can analytically calculate the uh, expected value of x minus a square. Essentially, that's the uh, deviation, all right? So time derived the expected value of x from this uh, average is minus two lambda times itself, Plus here, this is the term from this noise term. So for all the component i from one to the dimension, you add all this back expected value of x minus a square. So if you add all, all the terms, you get this d square, um, you get this d term, all right? So for here, you see x is going to converge to a in expected value with a rate that you want this, this constant to be negative. So that's why you want two lambda to be bigger than sigma squared times d. You want this to be negative. Then x will converge to a in the, in, in, uh, the average, all right? However, if you don't have the, if you do it component-wise noise, then here, this term is, is this one. It's x minus a, the i's component x minus a squared. Now you add all these d terms you get exactly, that's the expected value of this vector, x minus a, L2 norm. And you don't have this d, okay? So you see x will convert to a under the condition that two lambda is bigger than sigma square. Then this is negative. So we, we remove this d. So therefore our, our shift rate actually does not depend on dimension. Okay, you can see that heuristically, at least from this very simple case. Of course, I mean, in the realistic model, X star is not A. Actually, it depends on, you see, it depends on the solution, right? It depends on the solution, it's very complicated. So therefore you try to give some uh, rigorous proof why this works. So there has been previous effort. For example, the previous effort was mostly, instead of prove the convergence directly on the particle system, you take a mean field limit. You let the particle N go to infinity. All right, you take the particle number n, go to infinite. And then essentially get a fog Planck equation. Then you prove the fog Planck equation under, under this condition will converge, under certain condition will converge to the global uh, equilibrium. So that was, the, was done in this work of uh, Jose and uh, the company. And it's also in our first, first paper. All right, we just go to mean field limit. And there's also the related effort uh, by Fonesa and uh, Lorenzo and so on. They have written a series of papers for this uh, consensus-based method for optimizing on sphere. And uh, they, I just got this new paper uh, by Lorenzo where they use these binary interaction kinetic models. They establish connection with kinetic theory with binary collisions. Well, of course, if you really want to justify the convergence it's better to directly prove the convergence for the particle systems. So that's the work I will talk about next. All right, join with the Song Yiha at Seoul National, uh, Seoul National University and his former postdoc, uh, Dong Hing Kim, who is in Kias in Seoul. All right, so actually we have a 
conversion proof for the time discrete version of this particle system. So essentially, we discrete in time, all right? We use this point-wise uh, brown emotion uh, noise, and we take the time this the discretization. Okay. And we try to prove this dynamics, this Xi, this particles first form a consensus, and second, the consensus under certain condition is the global minimum. So that's what we try to prove. Of course, here we send some parameters here, like this uh, gamma here and this eta, which actually corresponding to a different time discretization. So here, what will be considered include explicit, explicit, basically forward Ola, Ola, Mariama, semi-implicit, also exponential integrator, because here you have your linear relaxation, you can use the exponential integrator and so on. So that just corresponds to different gamma and the eta, all right? So this uh, 1.2 covers all these different time discretization. So we ask the following questions. First, does these particles, well, first, these end state ensembles exhibit a global set consensus? All right. Namely, when the particle number, when actually when the iteration, when time step, when the iteration go to, go to infinity, does particle A and particle J will converge to the one point in some suitable sense? I mean, they all, they form a, form a consensus. All right. Well, if we get a positive answer to the first question, then we say, and what conditions on, on the system parameters and initial data? Does there exist a global consensus called denoted by X infinity? And all these particles will converge to global minimum. Okay. We want consensus to be in the neighborhood. It's basically, essentially, it should be close to the global minimum. All right, the answer to the first question is the following. Well, there's some conditions on these parameters. I mean, these are sort of stability conditions, all right? These parameters has to do with uh, the time step and so on. So these are essentially stability conditions. And uh, as I mentioned, it covers different time transitions of uh, that, that give you different lambda. But anyway, under this condition, and also con this condition for eta, then you can show that this, they do form consensus. So the expected value of particle i and particle j, this n is the iteration step. Eventually the expected value will be zero for any i and j. So all these particles will come to one point eventually asymptotically. All right. And then under some uh, uh, other conditions for this lambda and the psi, which is given here. All right. Then you can show that uh, you can show actually almost sure global consensus time asymptotically, all right? So basically, uh, first, the expected value of particle xi, particle j, when angle infinity will be zero. And we have also have this convergence rate, okay? So this uh, after n iteration, so this is a sort of a L2 norm is bounded by the initial L2 norm times e to the minus n times some function which depends on uh, this, uh, prime to omega, all right, which omega is this uh, uh, domain parameter, pra random parameter. And what's important is, yeah, if A is large, if A is very, very large, you get a lower bound for this guy, which uh, depends on this numeric parameter, gamma and uh, eta. And under this condition, of course, this uh, lower bound is strictly positive. So you have, you have exponential decay once the, the iteration step is sufficiently large, you do get exponential decay, okay? But the main idea, or well, the reason, well, of course, uh, this proof is not too difficult. I mean, the reason that the previous uh, paper didn't consider is because uh, they use different norm. They were doing L2 norm, the child, they'll do L2 norm. And then if you do L2 norm directly on particles, so you get actually exponential growth. If you do, you typically use ground wall inequality. All right, and what we did, the reason we could manage to work, finally do, did get the result for the particle system is because we estimate diameter. Essentially estimate the distance, the L infinite distance between uh, the uh, particle I and particle J instead of calculate L2 norm. So that this is the right norm to, 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 to use if you want to get convergence. 
not only mean field limit but on the particle system. And of course, to, to prove this, we need some assumptions. And here they are. Well, we first assume that uh, L is strictly positive. All right, this loss function, we assume it's L2. And this Hessian matrix, uh, sort of L2 norm, Hessian matrix should be has, uh, it's bounded. Okay. Spectral norm, bounded. And we also assume that uh, near the neighborhood of the global minimum, uh, there's some uh, convexity condition. So the Hessian matrix of L, this determinant near the global minimum should be strictly positive. Okay. And also we have to assume that, uh, well, okay, this F has to be complex supported and so on. The probability measure of, uh, uh, of this uh, random process should have compact support. And near the global minimum is strictly positive. Okay. All right, so then, well, first the theorems prove that they, they do converge to one point. The second proof prove that this one point, that the consensus is in the neighborhood of global minimum. So again, we assume the, the previous assumption holds and also have this uh, assumption on these numerical parameters. Okay. Uh, we assume the initial data is IID. Then under this condition on the initial data, I will explain a little bit this, what this condition means, all right? And then what we can prove is essentially this consensus is within a small neighborhood of global minimum. And there's the neighborhood, the, the size of the neighborhood is given on the right-hand side. We well, actually depend on D here. Well, here, this parameter does not depend on D, all right? But here you have D here, log beta over beta, plus something which is uh, capital O of one over beta. Well, this, this term decays faster than, than, than this term because it got a log beta here, all right? So therefore the error is essentially proportional to D over two log beta over beta. So theoretically, of course, for any dimension, you can choose beta sufficiently large, such that this term is small, okay? So essentially you get nice error for any dimension as long as, as you choose beta sufficiently large. But of course, numerically, you have some problem. You cannot choose beta very large because if beta is very large, you have e to the minus beta, then it may be too small. It may be within the machine position, so count at zero, essentially. All right. Well, remember, Lorenzo mentioned to me that he has some trick to, to handle this case, but I forgot what that was. And we discussed a little bit, and I, did, I didn't follow. All right. Anyway, so for here, you, you, that's the error estimate. Okay. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about this condition on the initial data, which is actually more severe constraint. Okay. Essentially, it looks complicated. It's very hard to verify because it's the expected value, all right? Numerical, of course, you cannot, you do not have this information about the expected value. So to say this condition in the world, essentially you require the initial data to be very close to global minimum, okay? Well, first you want support of initial distribution to, be, to contain global minimum, and second, the initial data of your iteration has to be close enough. And that's quite restrictive, all right? So it really depends on initial data. And in most cases, if you choose the bad initial data, you will never reach the global minimum. So that, that's uh, difficult. Okay, now let's, let's uh, show you some numeric experiment here. Uh, here, is, this is some uh, uh, objective function, all right? Uh, which looks like this. So you see, there lot is quite oscillatory. There are a lot of uh, local minimum, and here is global minimum. So this case actually is the cosmic gradient descent uh, uh, does a very bad job. So here, uh, this is gamma. So uh, this m, the number of uh, training data is uh, ten thousand training data. Okay, we use twenty particles. I mean, uh, sorry, I mean this n dimension is twenty. All right, so here's comparison you know, with uh, the CBO, we use 100 particles and the random batch, each, each batch we use 20, you use 20 particles. Here are some other parameters. So uh, of course in global, you know, uh, this uh, stochastic method, you never succeed just in one try. You have you given many tries, then you compare the successful rate. All right, so that's what people usually do in machine learning. So for this example, well, it's to our favor, right? Our algorithm actually has uh, almost perfect uh, success rate, where SGD has only 18% success rate. 
Then we try this uh, rust, rust tricking function of 20 dimension. So this is the plot in two dimension, in three, uh, two dimensions. You see it's high of three, three. There's a lot of uh, mini local minimum. So it's quite a hard problem. And if you use the previous algorithm, the German algorithm with this bar, with this bar, and then the success rate is not very high. Uh, this is the number of uh, particles from 50 to 200. Success rate is essentially one third to like two thirds. Why well, if we use the same parameter, exact same parameters, between uh, 50 particles and 200 particles, exactly we get success rate between 98 to 99, okay. However, if you increase dimension, when dimension is bigger than say like 25, then even our method does not have very low success rate, okay. So it works well for moderately high dimension, but not for very high dimension problem. Uh, well, this is uh, is fun. I mean, this is, you see how the particle moves. I'm mean, here initially sort of a uniform diffusion, then eventually they form clusters. So here you see the dynamics of this particle system, and this is actually the convergence rate for a different uh, noise level. Okay. So without noise, uh, it do not converge very. Well. With some noise, converge better, and the increase strength of the noise, you converge a little bit faster. Uh, this is a very standard test case in uh, machine learning called the MNIST data set. So what, what happens here is that you have a picture and the gray scale is from zero to nine. And the input data is a vector of dimension that's over 700, all right? And it basically records the gray scale of each, each pixel. And we use a neural network uh, with a single layer. We just use a single layer and use the neural network, all right? So this is a loss function. And uh, here we use a rectified linear unit, which is, is this function is zero when x, when x is smaller, uh, is negative when it's, it's x, when x is positive. So then you have a linear combination of uh, tra training data and this, uh, these are the weights, x, theta is the matrix and b is some uh, biased vector, all right? So this here, here are the parameters to, 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 to select is theta and beta, uh, beta we call it denote by gamma. So essentially, uh, this A is some activation function, which is given over here, softmax. And essentially, uh, this is a non-convex optimization problem of like 7,000 dimension, okay? So here's definition of the loss function. So we have to solve uh, essentially uh, optimization problem of 7,000, over 7,000. So these are the choice. Basically, we use 100 uh, particles. Okay, it's a random batch. Each batch has 10 particles. The number of training data is uh, 10,000. The number of test data is uh, also 10,000. So we use the training data to, to find find this uh, neural network. All right, find this parameter theta and beta, which give you f. Then we test test the neural network by like uh, 10,000 uh, test data. We see how successful, again, the accuracy of test data, all right? So for this parameters, actually we get a success rate, which is like 80%. We can get 90% if you increase N to be 1,000. If you use 1,000 particle, you can get over 90%, okay? So that's essentially what, what, what we can do. All right, so as I mentioned, well, this method works at least in this uh, rust rust uh, rust change in the case when dimension picks number twenty five and it does not work very well. So we try to do better than this. Well, to do that, let me first summarize the popular method used in machine learning algorithm. So here you want to find the global minimum of this f, which is high dimensional non convex. The most standard method is gradient descent. All right. And then uh, SGD is based on gradient descent. So actually you can view this gradient descent as sort of uh, like a Newton's equation, all right? And for Newton equation, actually one can introduce so-called so momentum uh, variable, which is uh, this M. So theta is like X. So this is like dx dt equals the momentum. And I have uh, F equals MA, the momentum equation. So this is like forcing term, all right? with some parameter uh, lambda here, alpha. And actually with the momentum, actually this equation, this problem is less of 33. So it has a little better chance to convert to global minimum. 
And then even a uh, modification of this is so-called adaptive, uh, adaptive, uh, I forgot what the full name is, uh, adaptive momentum estimation, sorry. Uh, I believe it, Adam, which actually not only here, you use only the uh, first moment, but I, actually this Adam method use also uh, the gradient square, all right? Uh, in some kind of a weight, uh, average, weighted average, it's convex combination. Okay. So that's the method, which works better, uh, but there's no theory, or right? it's a very little theory. The problem with machine learning is that uh, in most of the cases are based on complete experiment, there's no theory. Okay. So there are some theory for SGD, but not complete theory. And for the atom, there's very little theory, but it works quite well in a lot of situations. So the way, what do we do? Our particle method is the analog of this, where of course you instead of take gradient, use this uh, shift term. So our idea is that the way we also replace this gradient by the shift term. So we ha have what is called a CBO atom. All right. Uh, it's John works uh, Jingren Chen, who is at the Suzhou University in in, in China, and he's a uh, actually this is an undergrad student. So the idea is that we start from this atom. Okay, then we like what we did. Uh, if we change this gradient descent to uh, CBO, we replace the gradient by by this uh, drift term. All right, that's here. Then I have this second order I mean, gradient square, so that's the drift square. The other terms are the same, but then we add some noise here. All right, here we add the noise a little bit different. We do not use this geometric brown emotion. We just use so essentially a uniform. Uh, noise, which uh, our numeric experiment shows that this works better than uh, this uh, brown emotion, geometric brown emotion. For this system, of course, we have no theory, but we did a simple linear stability analysis to, to show that indeed, when t goes to infinity, <coughs> it converts to global minimum of this system under some condition, all right, so under this condition between these parameters. All right, so we have no theory, but we did a lot of numeric experiments and for very high dimensional problems. So again, we come back to this uh, function. Now the dimension is 100. So we use 1000 particles and these are different uh, batch size, all right, between five and 100. <coughs> it seems that small batch size works better because you probably add more noise. So we also compared the noise, whether it's a normal distribution or uniform distribution, it looks like normal distribution looks bad, but that's a better job, all right? So this is a successful rate for 100 dimensional problem. Of course, here is not very good. It's only 2% when you use 1,000 particle for 1,000 dimensional problem. However, you increase particle number to 5,000. Then for all different batch size, you always, pretty much, we always get with normal distribution, we always get, we get perfect uh, result. We always get the right uh, global minimum, okay. And so this is a comparison. Let me see, uh, this is what, okay. So this is what dimension of 100. We can, well, even now we go to dimension 1000. Now the particle number is in the range of 10,000. All right, the batch size is 50. Then we get almost 100% uh, success rate, even uh, even with the problem of 1,000 dimension, with only 10,000 particles. Uh, then we try to solve some PDEs with very low regularity. Remember, one of the goal for CBO is that uh, it works even if the gradient is, is you do not have the gradient. So these are the case when the SGD does not work because. Uh, the solution has a very poor regularity. So here we have elliptic equations, okay? Uh, boundary value problem. And here the A, the uh, diffusion uh, coefficient matrix is, is given here. And this problem actually has a, a analytic solution, which is only in H one half, okay? It's not, too, not very smooth. And also has singularity that x i equals zero. The derivative has singularity and x i equals zero. So what we did, we used this deep reach method, which was first introduced by y 9 e and u. So the idea is that uh, you write in the reach form, okay? 
Then you approximate this U by this uh, neural network uh, approximation function. You put it over here. So we add a parameter term here is penalty. You, 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 you try to enforce this uh, bond condition by this penalty term. Okay. And then we compare different activation functions. Here are some of the standard activation, for, uh, activation functions. ReLU, for example, sigmoid, which is one over one plus u to the minus x. We also try this activation function, which is uh, not very smooth. It's x to the power 0 0.5. So of course, if you do that, uh, SGD doesn't work. Okay. So here we we'll compare these different ones. They see that clearly this activation function is x to the power uh, essentially square root of uh, modulus of x. That's a better job in, the, in both L infinity norm and L2 norm. Okay, this blue actually gets smaller. This is the uh, iteration steps. You see that it gets the smaller air. Okay. All right. So basically, that's all I want to talk about. So I just make uh, some conclusion remarks. But first, the gradient free consensus based the interacting particle system are introduced for high dimensional non convex optimization. Okay. And we do have some rigorous mathematic convergence result for the CBO for both the full time, full time discrete particle system and also its mean field limit. You can analyze the convergence in both ways. And we can prove convergence under dimension independent conditions on the coefficients. However, this main re restriction on this method is that initial data is quite uh, restricted. It has to be very close to global minimum. Otherwise, you will never hit global minimum, okay? And well, although the convergence rate does not depend on the dimension, but the error, error analysis shows that it depends on dimension. Remember the error is D over two log beta over beta. All right, so it has to do with the error. Well, then uh, the original version of CBO actually is not very, very good uh, when the dimension is very high. Uh, to, to do better in that regard, we introduce this CBO Adam method, which seems to work uh, for very high dimension. However, there's no theory at all. We don't have any theory. It's all numerical observation, okay? So clearly there are a lot of research which needs to be done uh, in this direction. For example, there's no analysis if you do this random batch approximation and the mean field limit, for example, to really justify the mean field limit. And of course you need to, to really sell it well to the machine learning community. You have to do more computational tests and applications. So for that, I will stop. I thank you very much for your attention.